Hi, this presentation is about cooperative ownership, i.e. that is ownership uh, where you have associated complex rights relationships with other owners. So what you see in flats, condominia or compounds, for example. So I first want to talk about separating uh, sub-ownership rights from the main body of ownership. Uh, Scotland does these and refers to them as separate tenements and it comes to a range of different ownership rights, including minerals, salmon fishing, mines of gold and silver and petroleum. And these rights tend to come with further benefits so the owner of this sub-ownership right can effectively enjoy the right they hold. So access, right of access is a good example. So you can't really go and enjoy your salmon fishing right unless you've got the ability to walk over somebody else's land. And these don't tend to be seen as unnecessarily onerous by owners of that kind of principal land. Now, what about strata? Strata can be used to describe bridges or substrata to define tunnels. Um, and again, these associated rights of bridges and tunnels are also not seen as, as excessively onerous, and, and many of the issues there would have been solved in the original contract that separated them from the principal land. However, what about when flats and condominia use strata? So here, conceptually, a flat is strata airspace subdivided by reference to structures built in that air. Owners of flats have interdependent community co cooperative rights relationships with other owners in the flatted building, and these relationships are significantly more complex and onerous than rights required to support other separated ownership. There is a need to determine who owns the property above, below and around each flat, and these ownership relationships that each flat owner has with a common or shared area, so the lifts, the stairwells, the hall and the roof, and importantly, who pays for the maintenance of these shared areas. Other forms of ownership have these similar cooperative uh, relationship issues, and a distinction can be made between vertical and horizontal subdivisions. And so we'll refer to vertical subdivisions as strata titles and horizontal subdivisions as community titles and collectively all of these things as cooperative ownership, implying there's a cooperation between different owners in order to effectively uh, manage, excuse me, the property. And so cooperative ownership is defined as ownership with relationships with shared property that usually require maintenance. So why this emphasis on maintenance? Cooperative ownership requires ma payment of maintenance to be legally enshrined in perpetuity. You know, I am now the owner of this flat in perpetuity and I need to make sure that I will be paying for the maintenance of the lift that gets me to my flat. And this type of covenant is called a positive obligation. In general, jurisdictions uh, have rules that ensure that registrable covenants in perpetuity can only benefit land, and these positive obligations do not directly benefit that land. Hence, orthodox property law alone is not adequate for cooperative ownership, where encumbering positive obligations are required. So, how do you solve this problem? First instance, you could try leasing. You just simply remove the in perpetuity element uh, and leaseholders uh, can be encumbered by a range of uh, oh, sorry an increasing number of rights to landowners and this is the approach adopted by England and Wales where flats are normally held as leases rather than owned however citizens in many jurisdictions value ownership over leasehold so solution two is to extend ordinary property law and you can use specific registration law which extends the ordinary property law and allows positive obligations that supports the maintenance of strata and community titles. These tend to involve the body corporate, such as a housing association, which manages relationships between the owners, including granting easements for shared property where required, and has limited powers to create positive obligations and that's, you know, levy and administer any necessary finances. And New Zealand's legislation is a good example of this. So Units Titles Act 2010, Section 3 says the purpose of this act is to provide a legal framework for the ownership and management of land and associated buildings and facilities on a socially and economically sustainable basis by communities of individual owners. And so it's articulating the differences there between different bits of owned land and the fact that you have communities of owners. To allow for the subdivision of land and buildings into unit title developments comprising units that are owned in stratum estate, in freehold or stratum estate in leasehold or licensed by unit holders and common property that is owned by the body corporate on behalf of the unit owners. Okay, so it's starting to structure how 
this whole relationship works and to create bodies corporate which comprise all unit owners in a development to operate and manage unit title developments so there's this legal vehicle the body corporate which is a, a, essentially a trust for all of the unit owners and to establish a flexible and responsive regime for the governance of unit title development so you must be rules in terms of how you manage your um, land the literature defines two general approaches to structuring cooperative titles. It's dualistic, so it's a condominium ownership model, and monistic, which is a condominium user right model. The monistic model is defined as follows by Stoter. So the owners of the apartment units are joint owners of the entire building and the ground below. The co-ownership includes the right to have the exclusive use of a certain part of the building, the apartment unit. This means that the persons do not legally own a separate apartment unit, although the apartment ownership can be mortgaged. So your ownership of your apartment is not one remove and potentially held uh, as an off-register right. So the monistic approach relies on the ability to register a share in a flatted building, and each ownership share describes an area which is exclusively reserved for the owner. The owner has a real right in a flatted building, but exclusive access to an apartment in the same building granted in personam. And the share in this flatted building and right to exclusive use in an apartment are essentially treated as one. So when an apartment is sold, the share of the ownership in the flatted building, which includes use of a part of a building, uh, which is exclusively use of part of a building, is transacted to a third party. The dualistic model is defined as follows. Every apartment owner has full ownership of a part of the building, their apartment, their strata. The communal areas of a building, such as staircase and elevators, are held in common ownership. These can be described as compulsory co-ownership or an accessory related to ownership. So this turns it all on its head because you can actually start to, to own abstracted strata rights using this model. So the dualistic approach relies on the ability to distinguish between different ownership relations between different registered cadastral units. And both the accessory and restricted elements are important uh, distinctions. Accessory is semantically equivalent to pertinence, ownership and non-ownership rights which benefit owned land, so a cadastral unit. And restricted describes a set of parties who are allowed to participate in the rights relationships. And in many respects, what you can do with that rights relationship. So for example, having uh, you know what was ultimately a part share in the shared area does not necessarily give you the power to alienate that and transfer that to someone else without selling your main property. Using such specialisms we can see how strata ownership can be refined using rules to uh, flexibly reflect residents need and we will formalize concepts that describe these specialisms. And so the major distinction between these two types of model appears to be framed about whether the owner of a land is considered also as the owner of any of your buildings erected on it. And if you do have that approach, then you have to use a monistic model. If not, <coughs> and strata is recognised as registrable real property, then a dualistic model can be used. Okay, so that is kind of quite a lot of the legal background. We will now look at some of the patterns that we can use to... Um, to model these within an LADM environment. So let's have a look at some of the concepts to support cooperative registration patterns. In broad terms, dualistic takes a cadastral unit owned land approach to registration and monistic takes a party approach to registration. Now we'll initially consider the party approach. So in terms of registration, parties describe the things that can hold registrable rights defined by land. So you can have a, a natural party, you know, a person, an unnatural party, a business or a charity, uh, a trust or a joint ownership. So this could be the vehicle for your body corporate, as it were. In fact, an unnatural party or a trust would work. Or a cadastral unit itself. All of these elements are parties, are things that can hold rights in land. Uh, it doesn't have to be ownership. It could also be benefiting over a right of access, for example. And some of these parties then can become owning parties. So exclusive ownership, where you have a one over one fractional share. So full share of a cadastral unit or common ownership where collectively you have a share in a common area or uh, uh, owned collectively. Now the monistic approach relies on the ability to register a party share in a flatted building. The share describes the part of a building which are held exclusively by the fractional owner and there are a number of ways in which this can uh, be achieved and it's dependent very much on how the jurisdiction allows exclusive and common shares between natural parties and non-natural parties including this body corporate. And in many respects the point here is that the flat owners you know, uh, become part of this vehicle for the body corporate to own the land. 
So the body corporate can become the formal owner on the register and grants rights of occupancy to residents, natural or non-natural parties. And in such a model, a body corporate would likely take on the role of management and maintenance. It's also likely the trustees of a company board would comprise of all the residents. And this was shown clearly in the strata example. And it should be noted that the, sorry, in the uh, New Zealand uh, legislation. And it should be noted that the ownership is likely to be indirect. The residents will at best have a personal rather than a real right. As such, many of the legal details are managed off register, although the registered quanta can have a significant role in terms of voting rights. The dualistic model, um, from a patterning point of view, is much more interesting. So there's three concepts that support dualistic modelling. It's pradial pertinence, ownership inheritance, and subjects, i.e. that is the set of ownership rights implied through pradial pertinence and inheritance. So what's pertinent? A landowner may sometime hold rights in respect of heritable property beyond his own boundaries. Rights of this kind are known as pertinence. And here's a pertinence are a concept in Scott law, Scots law, but they have generic uh, modelling ramifications. So here we are. We have a, a main plot, a strata, a flat, uh, and it has a pertinential relationship with a flatted building. So it has, in this instance, ownership rights over other cadastral units. And it could also have beneficial ownership rights. Here's a right of access uh, through to something else, or it could even be a strip of garden. Pertinence is a legal shorthand for describing both ownership and ownership, which automatically passes to successive owners of land by implication. And so conceptually, the cadastral unit holds the right as a proxy for the owning parties. So in simple terms, pertinence represents rights held by the land, pradually, which benefit the owner of land. This means you get this emerging, emergent property of pertinence, which is running with the land. So when a dominant cadastral unit is sold, i.e. the flat, the benefit automatically travels with the land, becomes a benefit to the new owner. It's because that benefit is actually registered against the cadastral unit as a proxy for the true owner. So pradial rights are said to run with the land. Where you have a, a, a pradial ownership right, we refer to these as pradial cadastral units. So just bringing in a new piece of terminology there. And so pradial cadastral units can be used to model a range of scenarios, including shared driveways, remaining areas of a housing development, flatted building, common areas, pens, car parking spaces, and bin stores. <coughs> What's inheritance? Well, inheritance is another emergent concept which is implied by chained pradial cadastral units. So for example, if a cadastral unit A has ownership interest in a pradial cadastral unit B, which in turn has ownership interest in pradial cadastral unit C, what's the relationship between A and C? Conceptually, A inherits a beneficial ownership interest in C from B, and this should be narrated when title is derived from A. And this inheritance principle is theoretically infinite. So here we see there is a flat, and that flat has a 50% interest in the flatted building, and that flatted building itself has uh, exclusive ownership of a piece of ground somewhere else, and 50% ownership over something else, looks like a pathway. Uh, and when you derive title, it means you have an exclusive ownership of a strata, 50% ownership of a flatted building, you derive a new uh, amount for that, what was held exclusively by the flatted building, so it's now a 50% and a quarter for the principal land there, sorry about pathway probably shared with a neighbour, shared driveway. So let's have a look at the registration exemplar for dualistic cooperative ownership. Here are uh, a number of flats that we will pull out. So I've got some libraries, I've got a database, and I've got some code, and we will prepare our database. Yeah, always does that. There we are. So what we've done there is we've uh, created an application and we've registered it in our land register. And let's see what it looks like. So here is our cadastral unit. We have CU0, you know, the world according to our land register. So the development area is sold to a developer. So we put in our deed. So this is a deed of disposition for the flat grounds, which has a tuple on it. So it's got principal land and it's selling from the regional development agency to Mr. Rival the Builder. And he's going to take a 100%, a one-to-one -one element of that land. Um, 
uh, here's a cookie dough, CU0, here's a cookie cutter, uh, and here's a special number that is going to be allocated, and that essentially becomes our application. So we can look at that in terms of a deed, and because we're using the deed from our application, sorry, we're generating the deed from the application, we control the language of registration, and we have boilerplate patterns behind this that describe exactly what's going on, and we can register the deed. Brilliant. So if we now look at this, we see that we have two cadastral units, CU0 and CU1, and we also can see who are the owners of these cadastral units. Excellent. So now we're going to alienate the footprint of the building as principal land from CU1. So here we are, there's a, a, the, the ground and there's the footprint that we'll be removing. And this will be a transfer of land part. So we have our cadastral unit, we're going to cookie cut out an area from it and those will still be owned by uh, the man in black or Mr. Rival the Builder at the tail end of the process. So here we are. And if we look at it now, we have CU0, CU1, and CU2. So we have our flat footprint within the grounds, and this is the rest of the world outside. And if we have a look at who owns what, we see that Mr. Rival the Builder still owns both bits here. So there's no real change to that ownership. And then we're going to transfer the ownership of CU1 to CU2. So this is essentially saying, you know, there are some grounds, and these grounds are owned by this cadastral unit here. CU2. So again, this is a transfer. Sorry, this is a transfer of party part. And in this instance, uh, the part is uh, one over one, so it's a whole. Uh, so we will put in our deed, submit it, and let's see what we get at the tail end. So our cadastral units haven't changed because it's a party transfer. Uh, and see what comes out here. So exclusive right to CU2. Here's CU2, uh, and this one is exclusively held by Mr. Rifle the Builder. So you. Mr. Rifle Builder inherits the CU2, and that's held by the Regional Development Agency. So this is that pradial relationship. So from a legal point of view, land cannot own land. However, the owner of CU2 inherits this ownership of CU1 by proxy, and this pradially held right runs with the land. So when CU1 is transferred to a party, they will inherit CU2 when it is transferred. Now then, we're going to build uh, and alienate out each of the flats from CU2, resulting in uh, cadastral units 3 to 10. Fantastic. So this is a transfer of right part. So in our bag of rights for owning that ground we have strata and what we're going to do is say we want to build eight of these strata rights out uh, with our cookie cutter uh, and we'll retain them all with the, the landowner for the moment. Now we can do that using either absolute plots i.e full geometry or we can use them using things called relative plots where the spatial element is represented in what we've referred to as a grounded verbalization you know the cadastral unit from which it's been uh, abstracted from and then you have a verbalization within that cadastral unit that gives you a legally unambiguous um, representation of the space so here are our deeds and our applications and let's have a look at what comes out the other side so we have a lot more cadastral units hooray uh, and they all overlap one another so and all of these strata units uh, are owed a Hofheldian duty uh, from the owner of CU2 so who owns this well uh, it's Mr. Rival the Builder still owns everything in there so nothing has changed so now we're going to transfer a one eighth own share of CU2 to every flat, so that's CU3 to 10. Now we're going to do this directly to the um, um, to the party here, or what we could do is set up a vehicle uh, for for the body corporate to own this and each of the, um, the flats have our own share according to that. But we haven't decided to do that here, we've decided to do it directly with the um, right holders. So we see here that uh, we have an exclusive right to CU2, exclusive right to Mr. Rival Builder, and then rights in common held by CU3 for a 1 8th, CU4 for a 1 8th. So all of that has gone through. So CU2 is now owned in common by the owners of the flat, which at this stage is still owned by the developer. Hence the flats are uh, the owners in common of the shared areas in the flatted building. Um, as I said earlier, alternatively, body corporate could own CU2 in trust for every flat. And then, in this instance, and because we can, we're going to transfer a 1 6 share uh, 
of CU11, which is the lift, to the upper flats. You know, the ground floor flats have negotiated out of this and said, you know, we're not going to use the lift, we're on the ground floor, why would you use it? Uh, and so all the rest of the flats will pay for the maintenance of the lift. So that's fine. And so if we have a look at that plot there, here we come. Sorry, there is overlapping issues here. Uh, and now we're going to transfer ownership of each flat CU3 to CU10 to a third party. So we're selling this flat out. So ideally, the developer will have no interest in this land when it's finished. So let me put these rights in. And if we now have a look at who owns what, we have Dr. Black the author, Master Chip the carpenter, Miss Beak the judge. So the developer has no legal interest in this land anymore. He has no element to it at all. So what we've done. We've got our flats, and we've got our as-designed plan, or even could be an as-built plan. And we've separated out from the grounds the flatted building, and then from the flatted building, we've separated out the flats, and we've given the flats interest in the stairwell and the lift. And we can now use this to derive titles. So we'll frame what is our main plot, our seeding cadastral unit. In this instance, it's cadastral unit 8, which is a strata. And so what pertinence does that have? Well, it has a 1 8th interest in the flatted building and it has a 1 6th interest in the lift. Uh, and because it has an interest in the flatted building, the CU2 has a 1 1 exclusive ownership over CU1. And that resolves itself into this element here. CU8 is flat, uh, 1 6th in the flatted building, uh, sorry, for the lift, uh, 8 for the rest of the uh, flats and uh, an 8th for the uh, other building. And so we can now look at how we derive title for this. So let's have a look at the upper flat. And this is Mrs. Hat, sorry, Mrs. Hatter, the milliner. Uh, and this is a strata, one, two, first floor flat. And here is the spatial extent of their flat with the verbalization, that right modification to support finding it. Right. Now, the pertinence haven't actually been reduced here, so the fraction hasn't been reduced, but that's reasonably trivial. So you can see that you know, because you own that flat, you have interest in the flat grounds, you have interest in the building footprint, and you have interest in the lift shaft. Um, what encumbrances are there? Uh, well, there's no encumbrances here at the minute because I haven't put any in, but you know, essentially it's a spatial query that articulates uh, the relationships between the owned extent, the subjects, uh, and any of the rights held by third parties. And we'll quickly then have a look at the ground floor flat, because we can. Okay, let's put that back for next time. And so here we have Miss Green the Gardener, flat 02. So it's a ground floor, no lift shaft here. So it's a, a, a one eighth interest in a flatted building where you inherit a, a, an exclusive interest in a garden from a flatted building. Again, no encumbrances. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed.